What's up, folks? Back with another reaction. Back with another soundtrack. Uh, which is to say, you know, I've done a couple reactions recently. I did one from the Tricon soundtrack, which, you know, it's a bluesy sort of jazz tune, or maybe a jazzy blues tune. Um, but I just put that in this sort of playlist I have that's sort of a catch-all. It's like called like reggae, jazz, pop, etc. Um, but the fact that I've now done, I think, like two or three different um, tunes that are fundamentally from soundtracks or scores uh, means I think I should start a category just so I can kind of keep those separate. So like even though they might be of one genre or another, the fact that they're all from, you know, uh, pieces of fictional entertainment, whether that's a movie or a TV show, anime, whatever. Um, so yeah, hopefully that uh, playlist is up by the time you're seeing this. Uh, but I'm going to listen to a piece of music, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, The Mentalist, which is a show it ran in the U.S. I think it was from 08 to 2015. Um, I watched it very intensely the first few years. By like season five or six, um, I was finishing grad school and I was just, you know, intensely busy um, in a number of different respects. And so I just sort of like fell off of watching it the last couple seasons. I think it ran seven seasons. Um, I do want to go back and finish uh, 6 and 7. I think I saw it through the end of 5. Um, and then I just kind of didn't have enough time to like keep watching it regularly. Um, regularly. Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, it's a show uh, as quickly as possible about a character named Patrick Jane who used to be a psychic. Uh, he was basically a cold reader, had very good observational skills, and um, used to like wow people and mesmerize them in the way he could just quickly figure out things about them but he would present it as you know I'm reading your mind he was essentially like a con man but like a very perceptive and um, effective con man in terms of convincing people that he really had some sort of telepathic connection to their minds um, <clears throat> but at some point uh, he's on a television show I think he's on like a talk show and someone calls in and calls himself Red John and speaks to him in a very dismissive and threatening way and Patrick Jane sort of like tries to make light of it and kind of make fun of him and so on and then he eventually goes home and his wife and his daughter were murdered by this person who turns out to be a serial killer and he leaves his calling card as he leaves like this smiley face in his victim's blood um, so his life is shattered and he stops doing the you know psychic bit and he basically just, you know, wants to burn everything in his life, and he devotes himself to finding and killing uh, Red John. And so he ends up, because he's so good at, you know, observation and uh, deduction, he ends up kind of like Sherlock Holmes, working with a California state investigative agency, which didn't really exist at the time. It's, they call it the CBI, the California Bureau of Investigation. Uh, it didn't exist at the time. In real life, it now does exist. Now, they call it the CIB. Um, like the California Investigative Bureau, but literally the the bureau in the show predated the one actually in the state in which I live. Crazy. Uh, but in any case, he works with them as a consultant because <clears throat> he's so good at, you know, sort of seeing through people's nonsense and lies and so on, um, and he helps them solve a number of cases. So all the while, he's trying to compile evidence and figure out who Red John is, and this turns out to be a crazy thing because Red John... Over time, you start to learn he must work like somewhere high, like in you know um, law enforcement, and so there's um, you know it seems that whoever Red John is, they have insider information, so it's not easy to you know root him out and so on. So there's like on like long arc storylines as well as the individual stories. So in season three, there's an episode called The Witness. Uh, now by this time in the show, they've worked a num in a number of episodes with this coroner named Dr. Steiner. Now Dr. Steiner. He's sort of an old school guy, you know, kind of, you know, very like formal and so on. And he doesn't really get along with Jane because Jane's always like joking and whatever, which is funny because like people don't know Jane's background. He doesn't broadcast like what happened to him. So only a very few people who kind of know that history know his background. But most people just think he's this cavalier, joking, sort of silly guy, um, even if he's very smart. And so Steiner doesn't really get along with him and. Um, Patrick Jane is always teasing him and kind of, you know, making him look bad by, you know, playing tricks on him and so on. <clears throat> so they have this sort of adversarial relationship, although over time I think uh, Steiner does come to see how much Jane is involved in solving a number of cases and bringing people to justice, and so I think there's this increasing mutual respect. Well, we get to this episode, uh, 18th episode of the third season called The Witness, 
uh, and you find out, or Jane deduces, uh, that Steiner has terminal cancer. And, you know, Steiner is like, oh, like, why do you say that? And he's like, well, the pallor of your skin and the way you were talking about, you know, putting things in certain bank accounts, you're putting things in, in order and so on. Just, you know, it seemed an obvious conclusion. And he's like, you know, you're right, I, I am. And so then, like, later in the episode, he invites Jane over. And by this point, it seems like they've buried the hatchet. And so he invites Jane over and Jane goes. And uh, he says, look, I, you know, I work with dead bodies. I'm a coroner. I know this is going to get really bad, uh, and I don't want it to, to be like that. I don't want to be um, in that way. So I've made a decision to take some drugs which are going to take my own life, and I'd like it if you could just be here, like, whatever. And Patrick Jane, you know, the person who found his family members murdered and, you know, found their bodies is at first really uncomfortable with this and is like, I don't, I don't even think that's the right thing to do, you know, you still probably have weeks left and, you know, um, I, I'm just not sure I can be a part of this, whatever, and he's like, you know what, you're right, I understand, I, I asked too much of you and I, I apologize for imposing, you know what, um, you know, thank you anyway, and so, the, like, Jane goes to walk out and he stops and he's like, tell you what, do you have a cup of tea? And Steiner's like, uh, yeah, we, we have some tea in the kitchen. You, the cups are there. You could help yourself. And he's like, you know what? I think I will have a cup of tea. And Steiner sort of gets what that is. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go wait in the living room. And so Jane makes himself a cup of tea and he goes into the living room. And by then the drugs are taking effect and Steiner's kind of like sunk into his chair. And so Jane pulls out this coin and he does some of his old like carny tricks where he's again he was a like a mind reader but he you know he can um he worked in entertainment and trickery um so he has lots of little tricks not just you know his cold reading so he does this trick where he keeps making this coin reappear and disappear you know he's like holding it like palming it and so on um but it's really convincing and steiner gets sort of mesmerized by it and he's like, just keep focusing on the coin. It's here and it's gone. And it's here and it's gone. And he waits with him. And right as he's like really on the edge of losing consciousness, Steiner's like, Patrick, thank you. Uh, and it's just this crazy emotional scene. So this piece that we're going to listen to, I apologize for all the setup, but I really do feel like, you know, it helps to kind of have the gravity of where this piece originally came from. Um, this is the piece that plays, and so, you know, structurally it starts very soft and somber, and then it sort of brings in these chords, like very cold and kind of s like almost sad or at least like reflective, and then it gets to this sort of more melodic, more like energetic, it's still sort of like slow and plodding, but it's, it sort of goes up to this next level, and then it, the melody just finds this sublime place, and then it goes back to that kind of secondary level where there's some chords, um, but it's still like very minimal. And then it goes back to the very beginning. So it's sort of bookended. It's like part A, part B, the middle epic part, part B again, part A again. Um, but yeah, compositionally, it's fantastic. But the melody, the sublime part in the middle, like tears were streaming down my face when I watched this episode and in part of it was or part of it was this music is just the absolute perfect setting now again I think it works as a piece of music um, in terms of its epic <coughs> excuse me emotion outside of the the context of the show but if you do if you are curious uh, just type in uh, the mentalist dr. Steiner's death and the first couple videos that come up if they're like you know almost five minutes long um, you know, you can watch the scene for yourself. Uh, but with all that set up, let's get to it. This is Blake Neely from the Mentalist soundtrack, and the track is called Red Mile. I don't think I'm going to get emotional during this, but no guarantees.
the structure was a little different than I remembered. I thought that outro after that, you know, real kind of swelling of the melody was a bit longer and more similar in length to the intro. Uh, so it was sort of like A, B, A, B, C, B, um, as far as I could tell. Uh, but yeah, bottom line, um, it's just remarkable. And again, I think you could set that to a lot of different scenes. You know, it, it could be used in any scene where there's like a real tender, um, but also sort of like painful um, emotion at play. Uh, but again, um, it's impossible for me to divorce from the scene in which uh, it originally appeared. So again, if you're curious, I would recommend checking it out. It's only about five minutes long, uh, and it might be enough to make you want to like check out the series overall, um, even though again, it's like three seasons in. Um, yeah, it's just remarkable. Uh, but yeah, I love that like brief, you know, it's like a 30 second period. Um, where the like those chords of the piano kind of hit that next level and go to this like really sort of sublime place um, So shout out to Blake Neely a really well composed tune and the music for the show overall is really good um, But that one maybe stood out as much if not more than any other piece in the score over the like five seasons or so that I watched um, And again, I do want to eventually go back and see the final two seasons because you know you go like five seasons of watching a show um, you know, if something sort of practical prevents you from seeing uh, the end, uh, you do feel like, you know, I'm sort of obligated to go back and finish it off. So, anyway, let me know what you think of this piece. Let me know if you know any other work by Blake Neely. Um, you know, because I watch a lot of TV shows and movies over the years, um, there are a few cases where, um, you know, film composers and so on, I am familiar with uh, different works by them. But uh, as far as I know, Blake Neely, I've only heard his work as part of The Mentalist. Um, but again, uh, it's it's possible that he did music for a different show, um, and I was unaware of that. So uh, let me know what you think. Other than that, I will see you next time. Peace.